Multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. Uh-oh. Why am I talking about this? That there is a good question. This all started when I was reading a thesis from a student. And in the thesis, the student said something like, we use the variable inflation factor to check for the assumption of multicollinearity. What? What the f***? What? Something ain't right here. The assumption of multicollinearity. Sorry, folks, there ain't no assumption of multicollinearity. But before I explain that, let me talk about what multicollinearity is. Multicollinearity just means that your predictor variables are correlated one with another. Let me give you an example. And I've used this example before. If you want a more thorough explanation, go ahead and see the link in the description. So let's say you're trying to predict who's going to be wealthy in life. And you have two predictors, their family's wealth and how hard they work. And you want to figure out, are people successful because they grew up in a wealthy family or is it because they worked hard? Problem is, these two things are going to be highly correlated. If you grew up in a wealthy family, your parents probably had the mental space to remember to teach you to work hard. Or maybe they hired really good tutors who made sure you worked hard. Your hostility invalidates our parent-child contract. Or maybe these rich kids saw their parents working hard and thought, wow, all I have to do is work hard. Whereas the poor kids, they saw their parents work hard and it didn't make a difference. So in this situation, hard work and wealth are highly correlated one with another. And that's problematic when you're trying to say that hard work causes people to be successful when it's really intertwined with all these other factors. So now, back to my original statement. Multicollinearity is not an assumption. Multicollinearity is an annoyance. See, in linear models, there are assumptions and there are annoyances. Annoyances are different things that just make it harder for you to make sense of your model, like outliers, or small sample sizes, or multicollinearity, or having collaborators who don't understand statistics. None of our models assume that all of our collaborators know what we're talking about. Assumptions, on the other hand, these are requirements that the model makes in order to make inferences. Or in other words, the model requires these conditions to be met in order for your p-values and confidence intervals to have probabilistic meaning. And these assumptions are using the acronym LINE, L for linearity, which covers both linearity as well as the assumption of homogeneity of regression, which I will cover in another video because that's a whole nother can of worms. And I, independence, N, normality, and E, equal variances. Wait, did I miss something? What about multicollinearity? Again, it is not there. Multicollinearity is an annoyance, not an assumption. Well, tell me, why is multicollinearity so annoying to deal with? That there is a very good question. There are three reasons that may or may not be all really the same thing that make multicollinearity really annoying to deal with. Number one, it's very hard to figure out which variable is responsible for causes in the outcome variable. Like I said in my previous example, you don't know whether it's wealth or hard work that is causing these people to be successful because the two variables are so interrelated with one another. Number two, it increases your standard errors. So you know how I said it's really hard for us to tell which variable is responsible for doing the causing of the outcome variable? Likewise, it's really hard for the computer to tell. It really struggles to figure out how much predictive ability should be due to this variable versus that variable. And the way the computer expresses its uncertainty is through its standard errors. So if you have multicollinearity, it tends to be that your standard errors are pretty massive. And number three, it can lead to computational problem. Or in other words, the computer might really struggle to come up with an answer. I don't know anymore. And that will happen if you have what we call a non-full rank matrix. And basically what that means is that there's some combination of predictors in your model that can perfectly predict the outcome or perfectly predict other variables in the model. Now, it sounds like perfect prediction is a good thing. After all, we're trying to predict an outcome variable. Wouldn't it be nice if we have perfect prediction? And actually, that is not the case. And I'm not going to go into the details of why, but basically, in order to run statistical tests, there has to be some noise or there has to be some imperfection in prediction. And the short reason to why that is is because statistical tests do a signal to noise ratio. And if noise is zero, then you have division by zero and the computer blows up. Well, not really, but that would actually be kind of crazy and dangerous if doing statistics blew your computer up. Crap, my computer's on fire! Were my variables multicollinear again? Statistics is dangerous, I gotta tell you. So that's why multicollinearity is annoying. 
but it's not an assumption. So what do you do when you have multicollinearity? Well, I guess uh, the first thing you can do is identify it. And we can identify it by looking at scatter plots of the predictor variables and seeing if some of our predictor variables are highly correlated with one another. Or there's also a statistic that you can compute called the VIF or variable inflation factor. In supposedly VIF values higher than five or 10 mean that you have a problem supposedly and i'm super sarcastic about those benchmarks because i don't like rules of thumbs and there's almost always exceptions and so usually it's better just not to have rules of thumbs so once you identify it then one option would be to combine it and that's not something that i teach but that's something that i learned years ago that you can do like a principal components analysis to combine your predictors into independent predictors and that's all well and good there's lots of problems with that idea I'm not going to go into those right now but another idea which is probably simpler is just to drop redundant variables because multicollinearity is basically saying that you have two or more predictors that are giving you redundant information and so if the information is redundant just drop one of the variables simple enough and i started to ask myself why don't i teach students about variable inflation factors i do teach about multicollinearity but i don't teach students about the vif and i don't teach students how to deal with multicollinearity really why don't i do that i don't know i think the biggest reason is because there's only so much I can teach in two semesters of statistics. And VIF and addressing multicollinearity did not make it to my top 10 list, or even my top 30 list. Probably not even my top 50. So basically, I introduce it as a theoretical problem, but not a statistical problem. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why I don't teach about VIF. I just don't like teaching about VIF. Let me just kind of whatever this means. Explode my brain. Vomit ideas from my brain and maybe this will be cohesive after I edit the video. It just seems weird to me to address this multicollinearity issue, which is really a theoretical problem with statistics. Because statistics are really prone to capitalizing on chance and I would much rather make those decisions theoretically. I would much rather say, yeah, these two variables are really correlated with each other, and this variable is much more important to my research question than this variable is, so I'm gonna get rid of that other variable. But I think there's a bigger reason why I don't teach it. And I think the reason why I don't teach it is because I approach statistics from a very different perspective than most stats instructors. See, most stats instructors recognize that the people they're teaching stats to have very exploratory intentions, and they're using confirmatory tools. And when you have exploratory intentions, you probably shouldn't be using confirmatory tools, and certainly you shouldn't be presenting your results as if they were confirmatory-esque results. All these different hoops that people have to jump through, that really only makes sense if you're trying to take exploratory intentions and make the most of them with confirmatory tools, and I guess I just have a different perspective. I see exploratory research as very different from confirmatory research. So when I'm doing exploratory research, I know that variables are going to be correlated with one another. I know that I'm going to inflate my probability of falsely discovering something. I know I'm going to have lots and lots of problems, but I'm in exploratory mode. I don't care. I don't have to address those now. I'm just looking for something interesting. And so who cares about variable inflation factor? Who cares about multiple corrections? Who cares about all this crap that all these other teachers talk about? I'm in exploratory mode. I see it as kind of like brainstorming. When you're brainstorming, every idea goes out there. You don't want to limit yourself. You want to just throw even complete nonsense out there. And that's how I see exploratory research. And then when I do confirmatory research, I don't need variable inflation factors. I don't need correction for alpha inflation because I already know exactly what my model is in advance. I already know the exact procedure such that I can hit play in my R script and it runs with a fresh data set and I don't have to worry about anything. So I guess if I were to state this more concisely, I assume that the models that I'm using are either completely exploratory and I don't care about VIF and all that crap, or I have very targeted, well-considered hypotheses. And when I have very targeted, well-considered hypotheses, every single variable in that model has been very carefully considered. 
And when those variables are very carefully considered, we don't run into issues with multicollinearity, at least generally. And we're not controlling for these weird variable combinations like age and socioeconomic status and sex and cultural background and ethnicity, shoe size, head circumference, hair length, beard length. When you start controlling for that many variables, it tells me that you're really in exploratory mode and you're not ready to even worry about multicollinearity. So I don't know, hopefully that came out somewhat sensical. So in short, is multicollinearity a problem? It can be sometimes, but it's a problem, it's not an assumption. And we really shouldn't be worrying about it in exploratory research. And if we're using it in confirmatory research, we've probably already dealt with that problem. I guess that's all I have to say about that. Now you, go have a great day. Peace out.